Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Bu Elsa. Bu Josephine. Hai, apa kabar? <laughs> Okay, I think uh, all of the presenters already here. So uh, we here we have the judge. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Good afternoon, Dr. Elsa. Yeah, and good afternoon also, Dr. Astri. Yeah, good afternoon, Dr. Elsa. Happy to be okay. here. Okay, so Dr. Astri and Dr. Henry. The presenters are all already here in this breakout room too. So should we start? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Okay. So good afternoon and welcome for all of you. Uh, this is the session, oral presentation uh, sessions with topic uh, malaria and one health. So here, actually, we have four presenters. Uh, and three judges. Uh, however, one presenter, Bapak Ima Dewi Narta, yeah, uh, we just informed by the organizers that uh, Bapak Made cannot join today because of uh, something that's very urgent. So uh, finally here, we only have three presenters. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, to you the judge for this session is Dr. Uh, Dr. Henry Surendra, MPS, PSD, IFRSPH, and also Dr. Dr. Asri Ferdiana, MPH. And there are three speakers here. First, uh, Ms. Vinda Aisarul Asmi, Ms. May Shiali Lorenza, and also Ms. Anindita Fitri Mutiara Rizki. Yeah. Um, so this is the uh, rule for the session. So first the speaker will uh, present their uh, uh, presentations for seven minutes. And after that, there will be questions from the judges yeah, for five minutes. So please the judges, please uh, ready to uh, with that, uh, take the score for the presentations. So, here I would like to to say hello first to Vinda. Vinda, are you here? Yes, Miss Elsa, I'm here. Hi, Vinda. Are you ready for this presentation? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So, uh, without any further delay, so uh, let's start with the first presenters, Vinda Aizarul Asmi. Okay, you ready, Vinda? Please. The seven minutes is yours. Okay, first, thank you. First of all, I would like to share my screen. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Miss. Uh, the the host has disabled participants screen sharing, so. Okay, you cannot share your screen. So share. let yeah. okay. Let me. So, Vinda, can you just try to share your the screen? I still can't share it, Miss. Hey, one window. Okay. Please, Ba Angit. You hear, Ba? 
Yes, Bu Elsa. Ya. Saat sekarang sudah bisa, Bu. Oke. Okay. So, please try again, Linda. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to all of the participants in today's conference. I am Wihda Aisha Lul Azmi from Master Program in Biomedical Sciences, Universitas Indonesia. Thank you for having me here to present my current study. Development of Rodent Malaria Parasite Model Resistant to Artemisinin. Malaria is one of the infectious diseases that caused human mortality and morbidity and still a huge threat to public health. The World Health Organization has been conducting global technical strategy for malaria in order to achieve malaria elimination in 2030, especially in the 85 endemic countries. The World Malaria Report 2021 has reported that there is an increase in the global estimated malaria cases and death from the 2019 to 2020. And this happened because of the COVID-19 disruption and mostly the parasites resistance to several anti-malarial drugs. The anti-malarial drugs resistance has been one of the major hindrances in malaria control. The first resistant case was found in the 1950s Uh, when the chloroquine resistant parasites occurred followed by uh, the parasite resistance to other anti-malarial drugs. The artemisinin combination therapy, which is used for to combat that uh, anti-malarial drug resistance has been uh, found to be, uh, has been found that there is also an indication of the resistance of the parasite to this drug. With no alternative treatment available, the new anti-malaria drug development is urgently needed, since we also know that in population, we can conclude that there is already so many resistant and well, sensitive parasites spreading in the population. And the new candidate of anti-malarial drug should be able to clear both of the resistant and sensitive parasites. Thus, to screen this candidate anti-malarial drugs. We need the parasite model resistant to anti several anti-malarial drugs. And our laboratory has been uh, successfully developed parasite resistant to atovacon and pyrimetamine. And with the same method within heart selection, we would like to develop new parasite resistant to artemisinin. To develop a stable artemisinin resistant parasites, we use the Uh, called repeated incomplete treatment method where the parasite will be exposed to an adequate, uh, an adequate dose of artemisinin to clear the parasite without finishing the treatment process so that we could get the resistance of the parasite to mimic the natural infection in the population. We use uh, bulk sea mice infected with plasmodium brugge that cause two, three different regimes of uh, art ICT treatment. The RICT cycle would be started when the infected palsy mice percentage of parastemia reach 2% to 5%. The drug administration will be done in 24 hours until the percentage of the parastemia fall to 0.5% or less and let the paras parasite to recover and uh, the percentage of the parastemia increase again to 2% or more. And uh, after that, The treatment, the drug treatment would be continued, and this is the start of a new cycle. These cycles would be repeated until we can find the possible phenotypic resistance. This is the result uh, in this study. This graph shows the features of the RICT experimental system in the first group, where we use the dose of artemisinin 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight treated every 24 hours. We can see this that from these mice, it went on two days of treatment in cycle one, followed by three days on uh, recovery period and 10 days of uh, treatment in cycle two. The percentage of parastemia uh, increased dramatically on the day nine and uh, steadily increased until the end of the cycle two. And this is the summary of the treatment and recovery times observed in this group. We used 12 mice. And uh, the average of uh, 
times that needed to treat in the cycle one is for three days. And the average time for recovery uh, cycle is uh, three days too. And uh, the mice needs uh, six days in average to finish the cycle two. This is the second regimen where we uh, treat the mice with 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight of artemisinin in every 24 hours. And from this mice, from this graph, we could see that the mice only last for one day to uh, in treatment in cycle one and followed by three days of recovery period and 10 days of uh, treatment in cycle two. The percentage of the parastemia also increased dramatically on the day eight and relatively stable until the day 14 of the RICT. The average uh, days, the average days of treatment needed for cycle one uh, in this group is three day, two days, and the recovery period is three days. And for the treatment in cycle two is five days. This is the third one, uh, where we treat the uh, the mice infected mice with uh, ten milligrams of uh, ten milligrams per kilograms body weight of artemisinin every twelve hours. We can see that the slope in uh, the graph. And this regime is much different with the uh, the other two regimes. We could see that percentage of the parastemia in this regime is much lower. Yeah. Uh, in this mice, they spend three days in treatment in the cycle one, three days for recovery period, and three days for the treatment periods in the cycle two. And for your information, for this third group, uh, we can uh, we. Uh, it's still, it is still ongoing experiment, so we can still update this data since the mice right now still in the middle of the cycle two. And this is the summary of the treatment and recovery times needed. Um, the average days they need uh, to spend the cycle one treatment in cycle one is four days, followed by four days for recovery uh, period, and in average two days of treatment in uh, cycle two. And it's still continuing right now. And the conclusion of the studies is the regimen of artemisinin induced uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight treat every 12 hours seems to give the most promising result in developing a stable artemisinin resistant parasite. And for the ongoing experiments, we would like to do the molecular analysis, the whole genome sequencing to uh, see, to confirm the possible resistance uh, of parasites that could have been obtained. I think that's all I can present today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Winda. Applause for Winda. So exactly seven minutes, clear and nice presentation. So I would like to invite the first judge, uh, Dr. Astri, please. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Dr. Elsa, and uh, thank you, uh, Winda, for the nice presentation. Uh, actually, I'm not really a, a animals, an animal scientist, so uh, if you can explain to us uh, what is the implication of your main findings to uh, the regimen of uh, artemisinin for human, is there any implication that we can learn? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I tried to uh, uh, we tried to develop the rest Artemis in resident parasites here in rodent malaria is for the model. Uh, we use the uh, method repeated incomplete treatment where uh, we develop based on the natural and human infection. So we hope that with this resistant Artemis in parasites that um developed through this RICT method we could use this uh, parasite to analyze the mechanisms of the resistance in the uh, in the artemisinin resistant parasites and uh, we could also use these resistant parasites on the drug new anti malarial drug screening uh, method so that we could uh, find the new drug candidates that could also um, clear both not only the wild type parasites but also the uh, resistant parasites and for this one specifically for artemisinin and resistant parasites. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any data on uh, to what extent the uh, resistance to artemisinin uh, has, been, has been found on human? Uh, the artemisinin resistant uh, 
that has been found in human, if I'm not mistaken, it's already uh, indicate, uh, found since the 2008 in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And um, not uh, in the recent years, there is also mm -hmm. the findings in Africa too. So since the artemisinin is one of the first line antimalarial mm -hmm. drug that used in ACT, yeah, I think it's really important for us to understand more about the resistance of this drug. And the study could help that. Mm. Any evidence of uh, artemisinin resistance in Indonesia that you know of? In Indonesia, uh, oh, the latest no, data no, I found mm. in uh, West Sumba of Indonesia, okay. it's indicated that it is also artemisinin resistant. Okay. Uh, that's all for now, uh, Dr. Elsa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asri. So the I invite the next judge, please, Mr. Dr. Henry. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Elsa. I think I think Dr. Asri already took uh, the question actually, but uh, congratulations to to Inda for the nice uh, presentation. Uh, maybe only one question from me because I saw your in your conclusion you say you said that your conclusion seems to be uh, like not really conclusive to me because you you said it in not a firm way. So do you do you think that uh, in your in, in your statistical analysis that you can you know perform a more robust analysis so that you can you know you can uh, then firmly say that uh, it is. Uh, significantly, you know, uh, you, uh, that that the finding that you found is really significant, because I saw the graph that you plot is is basically like descriptive graph. Is there a way to do it? Um, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, sir. Actually, uh, from this data, I haven't, uh, I couldn't, uh, I still couldn't uh, do the statistical statistical analysis. So. Uh, since my objective is to uh, develop new um, artemisinin and resistant parasites, like uh, I did the selection from the wild type uh, parasites to get the artemis artemisinin and resistant parasites. So uh, this is still uh, like a preliminary study, like uh, how is the uh, the features or how the pattern of our ICT uh, treatment that I did to develop this artemisinin and resistant cause. And um, if I already, oh, and uh, based on the this data, like um, I already see that the the pattern of the RICT cycle in the third regime uh, is uh, more clear between the treatment periods and the recovery periods rather than the, the other regimes. And, uh, the other reason why why I said that the third regimen is the most promising one is because in the first and the second regimens we could see that the, there is a dramatic uh, increase of percentage of parasitemia on the day nine and the day eight uh, in average or to all of the mice and uh, the amount of the percentage of parasitemia is uh, too high like. Uh, it could disrupt the RICT process since if the parastemia is too high, it could also affect the uh, drug effectiveness in uh, clearing the parasite. So uh, I hope with the current data um, in the third regime, I could um, get the resistant parasites like my objection. Yeah, okay, I think I think that's all from me, Dr. Elsa. Back to you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, my question, uh, Vida, looking at looking at the result of the two therapeutic group, uh, I see that the 10 milligram per kilogram body weight is so promising result, is it right? And in inducing the stable artemisinin resistant parasite. So uh, do you think that for somehow the resistant artemisinin, um, uh, what's that? The resistant, the parasite that resistant artemisinin you develop can turn to be susceptible again for after several cycles. Is it possible, Vida? Uh, thank you for the question. 
um, the objection is to find the stable, stable uh, artemisinin resistant parasites. Mm -hmm. So that if we uh, grow this uh, isolated parasites from this experiment into a new boxing mice, it, it still uh, have its resistance uh, it still have its resistance so that if we treat the uh, parasite, this parasite again with artemisinin, the drug would not be uh, effective to clear the parasite. And uh, for the 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight treated for 12 hours, I said that it could be the best uh, regime to, to develop the artemisinin resistance because um, uh just like i said before that we can see the clear pattern and uh and we can see the clear pattern and um sorry uh for the uh for the uh what can i say uh if the atomic in resistant parasite uh have a stable have a stable uh resistance it couldn't uh, it could stay for a long time, even though we, we already cryopreserved the parasites in a long a long time. So we hope that even if we grow this again, the resistant parasite uh, the resistance is still there. Okay. Uh, and your suggestion, uh, Vida, you uh, suggest that the next step in this study is to investigate the predicted gain target corresponding to artemisinin resistant. Would you like to explore more specific about this gene target? Is it like, uh, let's say, Cal13 in Plasmodium falciparum or, or what? Yeah, uh, I would like to elaborate more on the possible mutations that happen in this uh, resistant parasite since uh, the reason why we use RICT is the RICT was developed uh, to mimic the natural infection in human, and as the experiments, uh, sorry, as the uh, experience in uh, our laboratory that we already have uh, developed an autofacon resistant parasites, um, it turns out that the autofacon resistant parasites we uh, get at that time was dose dependent, and it could be. Uh, different if we use different, uh, it, uh, it could uh, give a uh, different mutation degree if we use different uh, method to develop it. So we use the RICT to mimic the natural um, infection that happens in humans so that we hope that um, the mutations that occurred in this parasite model, resistant parasite model, could repression could represent what that happened in human. Okay, thank you, Winda, for uh, your answers. Uh, thank you very much. And now we will move to the next uh, presenter. Thank you, Winda. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. Yeah, I would like to introduce you to the next presenters. Uh, we have Meshali Lorenza. Hello, Meshali. Meshali or Lorenza? Uh, you can call me Mesha. Mesha, okay, Mesha. So, Mesha, you will present your works on a systematic review. Is it right? Systematic review uh, plasmodium falciparum transferases as potential targets. Is it right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so Mesia, uh, the Zoom is yours for seven minutes, please. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, is my screen visible? Yeah. Greetings to the Honorable Committee, judges, and my fellow participants. My name is Michelle Lorenza, coming from the Department of Biomedicine at Indonesia International Institute for Life Sciences. 
And first of all, I would like to thank you for providing me the time to present my uh, to prevent our systematic findings on the plasmodium falciparum transpressis as potential anti-malarial targets. So I believe that most of us here have been uh, familiarized with uh, malaria, which is an infectious disease caused by the plasmodium falciparum and uh, caused by the plasmodium species. And among the five plasmodium species, the plasmodium falciparum is the most life-threatening species because it can lead to rapid progression to severe infection. And unfortunately, this species also accounts for uh, more than 90% of the malaria-associated deaths. So although this parasite has been identified and researched since 1880s, the elimination of this parasite remains very challenging. And one of the uh, hurdles to eliminate plasmodium is because of the spread of multidrug resistant plasmodium falciparum strains. So plasmodium has an extensive ability to undergo gene mutations that will alter the structure of the targeted enzymes. So as we can see here, they can like alter the active side of the enzymes so that drugs that uh, previously designed to target this structure becomes uh, in, uh, does not interact with the enzymes anymore. Or otherwise, uh, plasmodium also can express efflux transporters. So the drugs will be omitted uh, out of the uh, parasite cells. That's why we would, uh, that's why we need a new anti-malarial target. And in this presentation, I would like to bring plasmodium falciparum transpresis into the discussion. So generally, transpresis are a, a class of proteins that uh, help the transfers of a function, a functional group from one molecule to another molecule. And in plasmodium falciparum, it, it, it presents abundantly and also involved in various biological processes such as gene expression, protein localization, cell cycle progression, and antigenic variation. But unfortunately, uh, this class of proteins is less studied and understood um, for anti-malarial targets. That's why uh, we want to summarize all information regarding the potential for uh, plasmodium falciparum transpressis to be targeted uh, for malarial drugs. And it's uh, to achieve that uh, goal, we did systematic review. And here, the systematic review will, uh, was done by three reviewers and uh, we managed to collect more than 1,000 articles, but uh, of these 1,000 articles, only 20 articles that fulfill our study criteria and also eligible for final inclusion. And from these 20 articles, we identified 11 drug interacting PF transpresses that present in either sexual or asexual blood stages. So what it uh, so what means by drug interacting PF transpresses is that the transpresses has been uh, tested against drugs. So they showed interaction when, uh, when treated with drugs. And from these 11 drug interacting uh, transpresses, we can actually categorize them into uh, based on their prominent function, such as the metabolic regulation, epigenetic regulation, and lipid biosynthesis, also, as well as protein lipidation. So this is the 11 drug interacting transpresses. Three proteins are associated for age metabolic regulation and epigenetic regulation, while the other five uh, proteins are associated with lipid biosynthesis and protein lipidation. A more detailed description will be covered in the next slide. So yeah, the first class of proteins are associated with metabolic regulation. So we can see here there are N, NMNet, ATC, and HMT, uh, which generally they are involved in cellular metabolism to produce energy, and some also um, produce metabolites that are important for DNA or pyram pyramidine synthesis, uh, basically our DNA or RNA synthesis. And some drugs that have been tested against this class of uh, proteins are NMNet inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors. mTOR inhibitors itself is uh, 
a repositioning drugs. Uh, so previously it was used to treat cancers and also have pirazolopiran based compounds. And the next class of protein is associated with epigenetic regulation. Uh, this include histone lysine methyltransferase, histone f methyltransferase, and histone arginine methyltransferase. So uh, all of these transferases are involved in post-translational modifications of the histone proteins, and they are involved in the regulation or expression of virulence genes or genes um, or genes associated with the growth or replications of the parasite itself. And some drugs that have been tested against these class of proteins are G9A inhibitors. Again, this is a repositioning drugs that previously used to treat cancers also. We also has ADOX and HSTIB60 inhibitors. And the last class of drugs we have uh, PMT, PPT, ISPD, and MT and DHHC PATs, uh, PATs, which are associated with lipid biosynthesis and protein lipidation. So all of these five uh, transferases are involved in the synthesis of cell membranes, so which means they are very important, essential in the growth of the other cells of the parasite, and some also uh, important for the transmission and also inflation or interaction with the host cell membranes. And some drugs that have been tested against uh, these types of Transferases are amodiaquine, uh, tetrahydroquinoline, phosphomidomycin, uh, and also benzothiophene and 2 bromopalmitate um, Some of these drugs are repositioning drugs like phosphomidomycin. We have used this as antibiotics, but uh, researchers also try to use these uh, antibiotics to target parasites. So to conclude my presentations, I would like to emphasize that plasmodium falciform transferases are potential targets, uh, potential novel targets for anti-malaria drugs because it is uh, involved in uh, the parasite, the, uh, in the growth of the parasite, the pathogenicity, as well as the virulence of the parasites. However, uh, most drugs that have been mentioned before and also have been examined in by the previous studies exert antiplasmodial effects at micromolar concentration, which is quite high compared to currently available drugs. Therefore, for the recommendation, it would be uh, great if researchers can optimize the structure and the size of existing candidate molecules through n silico approach. And for drugs that have exert and uh, potential antiplasmodial effects, it would be great to investigate the pharmacokinetics uh, of the repositioning or candidate drugs. So that is all from my presentation today. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Ms. Yeah, thank you and congratulations for your systematic review result. Yeah. So now I would like to invite Dr. Henry for the first question, please, Dr. Henry. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elsa. Uh, thank you very much, um, Messi, for your nice presentation um, on the topic of on the systematic review uh, study. I think uh, one um, uh, important question will be: I don't, I don't want to criticize the methods uh, because you know some people will argue that systematic review is not research, but some people will argue it is research. Uh, what I wanted to follow up is regarding your recommendation about the next the next um, research uh, following up this uh, your conclusion. So if you have money uh, to do more robust research, uh, can you please elaborate uh, your uh, what will you do? Uh, you know, in regards to your recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Henry. So uh, based on our systematic review, we managed to find several potential uh, proteins uh, compared to other transferases. So there are four most potential transferases uh, that has been tested in vitro and in vivo that they exert high selectivity against uh, 
human cells. So uh, like thousand fold cell activity uh, compared to the human cells. So these four most potent uh, proteins are fall in the categories of metabolic regulation and also lipid biosynthesis and protein lipidation such as the NNAP, uh, NMNAP and also ATC and HMT. Uh, this drug, uh, and they also have several drugs tested against these proteins. So if I have the money to do uh, research in the lab, I would like uh, do screening, uh, like hip screening maybe, uh, like to, to find the potential uh, substance that interacts with the drug, uh, that exert the most potential or the most therapeutic, uh, the most therapeutic effects uh, that could interact with these proteins and also uh, have safety profiles to be uh, consumed by humans. Uh, but before that, I think in silico approach would be beneficial because previous studies have shown that these um, previous study have shown that these proteins are exerting uh, are exerting antiplasmodium effects that are potential but uh, by using repositioning drugs they have like uh, their uh, their concentration are about micromolar concentration which is quite high compared to currently available drugs so i think by using in silico study we can like uh, polishing the structure of the enzymes so that um the uh, polishing the structures of the uh, the drug, sorry, the drug, so that it will target and interacts uh, stronger with the enzymes. Thank you. I think that's all from me, Dr. Esa. Thank you. Uh, next, Ibu Astri, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Elsa, and thank you, uh, the authors, for uh, the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, because you mentioned that you did a systematic review, uh, could you elaborate, uh, because in systematic review, we usually use the PRISMA guideline and also uh, PICO uh, principle. Uh, could you uh, explain each of the PICO, uh, the population intervention uh, and everything uh, to your, how, how do you apply this? Uh, Pico to your uh, systematic review and why did you use systematic review approach rather than a simple narrative uh, narrative review or scoping review? Oh, okay, thank you for the question. Um, Bu Astri, so um, in our in our systematic review, I don't think Pico uh, Pico uh, Pico uh, does not like really align with our study because uh, we don't really compare the outcomes. Of so I don't think. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think it's the other way around. Your study doesn't is not really in line with systematic review principles because in systematic review we usually. Uh, well, systematic review uh, came from clinical medicine. So it used population intervention, comparison and outcomes. So I don't think how you can apply the systematic review principles into laboratory uh, science review, like what you did. So okay, I, I'm uh, just wondering why you uh, call your study as a systematic review rather than a narrative review or scoping review. I think it's more suitable for subscoping review. Okay, we, uh, we call this systematic review because we gone through the uh, process of systematic review. Like we did identify, uh, we did ident we did as uh, set up the uh, the word the, the search terms for the uh, systematic review. We also like extract uh, all of the articles that align with our search terms into- But you also do that in scoping review. You, it's, it's not an exclusive approach for systematic review, but in any kind of review, including scoping review, you also use that kind of uh, 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 approaches, selecting keywords and selecting uh, 
uh, articles, abstracts, and then extracting abstracts. It doesn't mean that it's systematic review because in any kind of review, you would do that anyway. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but I think that one that makes us different from other reviews is that we, we did the eligibility uh, criteria studies, uh, which is also- uh, Yeah, applied. that's also done in a scoping review. You also uh, make inclusion criteria on what which kind of uh, studies that you would include in your scoping review. So I think you and your team should uh, think again uh, because when you submit it to a journal, uh, I think you should be very clear that it is, is it a scoping review, narrative review, review or systematic review? So don't say that the PICO statement or the systematic review principles uh, uh, is not in line with your study. I think uh, you need to decide wh uh, which uh, study design uh, you, you need to think again uh, about your study design, whether it fits with the principles of systematic review. It's not the other way around, okay? Also, what you mean is that all systematic review will be using the PICO principles? Uh, most of the time, yes. Okay. Yeah, but also it depends on the journal because some journals can be very strict. I don't know about um, uh, about laboratory science journals, but yeah, as uh, Dr. Henry mentioned in the chat box, people sometimes confuse systematic review and narrative literature review. Sometimes people thought that doing it in a systematic way can be called systematic review, but it's not. Because also in narrative review and scoping review, we also do the same uh, kind of steps. So please, um, okay, yeah. you should check again uh, the principles of systematic review and mm -hmm. see if your study fits with, it, with their criteria. Otherwise the journals would not uh, accept it. Thank you for the insights. Thank you, uh, Dr. Astri. So Mesia, uh, this is an interesting study to investigate the new uh, drug target yeah, for plasmodium but maybe the, the was that the terminology you choose is the, not the right one, the systemat, not systematic review. Yeah. I'm just curious about the uh, searching term you use in this, uh, in this investigation. <laughs> What's the search term? Okay, we applied three search terms, uh, which is the plasmodium falciparum mm -hmm. and blood stage transferases and drug study design. So, uh, which means that all all transferases, all the uh, blood stage transferases uh, have been tested against drug. Oh, and okay, also, okay. Yeah. Okay, so is it uh, in the, the paper you, you found? Is it all in vitro or is there any in vivo and ex silico, et cetera, or, or it yeah, mix? They are, they are mixed. Uh, some are in vitro, some are in vivo, and some also in silico. Yeah, I think that will be a little bit hard yeah, to compare the outcome of the drug target if we have like a different set of different uh, study, study setting. Yeah. It's just uh, my, my suggestion. Okay, thank you, Mishia. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, last but not the least, we invite the speaker, Andita Fitri Mutiara Rizki. Hello, Andita. Thank you and hello. Yeah. You will present your study, uh, experimental study, right? You have experimental yes. study, yeah? in searching new anti-malaria drug candidate. Okay, and in, and in Andita, yeah. Andita, you have seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. To present. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to share my screen. Yes. Um, Good afternoon to honorable judges and all participants. 
My name is Anita Fitri Mutiareski from Master Program in Biomedical Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. Thank you for having me here. In this occasion, I would like to deliver my research presentation titled Evac Extract Mangrove Plants Sonaratia Alba Against Plasmodium Bergi Sensitive and Mutant Atovacmon. Sorry. Yes. Malaria is one of infectious diseases that cause major burden for health aspect in the world, caused by parasite named Plasmodium and transmitted by mosquito named Anopheles. And according to World Health Organization, 2021, 38% of malaria cases in the world come from Southeast Asia region. And one of concern faced to control malaria disease is antimalarial drug resistance, and this is required solution by developing new antimalarial drug. And the candidate of new antimalarial drug is expected not only to kill sensitive parasite, but also the resistant one. And the variation of sensitive and resistant parasites is representing the condition in the field. As we know that Indonesia is a country with very, very high variation of biodiversity, and one of them is mangrove plant, Soneratia alba, or as well known as Barpat. And uh, based on the earlier study, Soneratia alba has uh, activ antimalarial activity in Plasmodium bergei sensitive in ex vivo. And also, Soneratia alba extract has activity to inhibit dehydrated dehydrogenase or DHODH enzyme that found in mitochondria malaria parasite. And our group has also established the atovapone resistant malaria parasite model in Plasmodium, Plasmodium bergei Y26HS mutation. So the purpose of this study is to, uh, to know the antimalarial activity of Soneratia alba plant extract against malaria parasite Plasmodium bergei sensitive and atovapone resistant Y26HS mutation. And the objective of this study is to investigate the efficacy of Soneratia alba extract in Plasmodium bergei sensitive and atovapone resistant Y26HS mutation using in vivo method. And the method delivered in this research is antimalaria activity test using in vivo method in rodent model. The rodent model with this, uh, that used in this research is groups of Plasmodium mice, 8 to 12 weeks old, and the parasite is the Plasmodium bergei sensitive and Plasmodium bergei atovapone resistant Y26HS mutation, and the extract itself is Sonerati alba plant extract methanol. And the treatment method that conducted in this research is by using intraperitoneal injection. And then uh, we divided six group of infected Belpsi mice, and one of group of Belpsi mice is consists of three mice, and four groups of infected Belpsi mice were treated by Soneratia alba extract in various concentration, and one of groups is uh, uh, for negative control, which is untreated, and then for the one group is for positive control, they treated with atovapone trafetic dose, 15 mg per kilogram body weight, and the treatment is conducted for four, day treat four days treatment. And then uh, we monitor the parasitemia level of each mice during four days treatment using blood smear. And then this is the growth rate uh, of the parasite plasmodium uh, bergei sensitive that treated by Soneratia alba extract in ex vivo. Uh, we could see in here that uh, Soneratia alba extract, uh, 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 the uh, plasmodium bergei sensitive that uh, untreated control and uh, uh, treated uh, treated group with the Soneratia alba in zero zero hour before incubation in uh, uh, this one uh, only showing in a ring anthropozoid stage and after uh, 24 hours after incubation the untreated control parasite showing the uh, growth of parasite from ring anthropozoid stage to the Skyzen stage. Meanwhile, in the uh, uh, parasite plasmodium bergei sensitive that 
uh, treated with Soneratia alba extract in various concentration is not showing any growth of uh, parasite from ring anthropozoid to schizen. And this pattern has similar pattern with the uh, plasmodium bergi sensitive that treated with atovacone drug um, as passive control. And this is uh, the graphic of growth curve of plasmodium bergi atovacone resistant Y26HS mutation that treated by Soneratia alba in various dose of concentration. We could see that this is uh, one group of uh, positive control that treated using atovacone therapeutic dose 15 mg per kilogram body weight showing any increase of parastemia level during for this treatment. Also the untreated uh, group and uh, the other uh, group of mice that uh, treated with Soneratia alba extract in various concentration. And this is for the uh, growth rate of the uh, group of mice par parasite that treated with Soneratia alba extract in various concentration. We, we also could see that group of mice that treated with atovacone therapeutic dose 15 mg kilogram per kilogram body weight is showing the decrease of parastemia level during for this treatment. Meanwhile, the untreated group of parasite and uh, the other groups uh, showing the increase of parastemia level. So the conclusion of this research is Sonaratia alba extract inhibits growth of Plasmodium bergay sensitive in ex vivo. Meanwhile, Soneratia alba plant extract did not show any antimalarial activity in in vivo against plasmodium bergay sensitive and autofacone resistant Y26HS mutation. So this is brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, Anin Andita. Yeah. So the first question, uh, this from me, just clarification, Andita. Uh, what part of the mangrove uh, plant that you use for the extract here? Uh, for from the extract, uh, we use plant extract from the leaf. Yeah, I think you should mention it, yeah, because oh, yeah. it may be leaf, maybe roof, uh, root, maybe also stem. Yeah, so yeah. okay, that's clear now that it's from the leaves. Okay, and Andita, is there any explanation why the extract can inhibit the growth out of the plasmodium bergay sensitive ex vivo but not an in vivo study okay thank you for the question dr elsa um, because uh, for the experiment in ex vivo uh, we we could screen that uh, uh, this uh, soneratia alba extract has uh, anti malaria activity that inhibits they, they can uh, inhi inhibits the growth of the parasite in ex vivo but why not in in vivo because in vivo is uh, we we use uh, living organisms such as mice uh, as uh, as the um, model and then we we should uh, cons consider the uh, metabolism of the mice itself so uh, I think they have a uh, different result from ex vivo and in vivo experiment from antimalarial testing. Okay, so so for the conclusion, would uh, will you would it continue this this uh, experiment or not? If there is the in vivo uh, show uh, unsuccessful. Uh, I think I will continue this experiment, uh, but for uh, the future plan for the experiment, uh, I will uh, redo the experiment uh, because this uh, uh, this research requires redo the experiment, especially for the in vivo experiment, uh, and also considering about the uh, uh, biophytochemical of the uh, extract itself, and then uh, uh, probably uh, use seeing another batch of the extract itself. Okay, thank you, Andita. So thank please, uh, Dr. Henry, question. Thank you, uh, Andita, for your presentation. My first question will be uh, about your sample size. Uh, I saw you, you, you presented that you have six uh, different group of mice. Uh, but I don't see uh, the description of how many, uh, what is the sample size per group that you, uh, that you have in this study? That's, that's my first question. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Hendry, for the questions. For each group of mice, uh, we use uh, three mice per each group. Okay, three mice per each group. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think this this also related to to uh, you know to your results data because um, one, do you think three will you will give you uh, enough sample size to show the pattern? Because uh, you you will need to do like uh, not only I think in my mind it's what you need to do is not only uh, do the you know the descriptive statistic so showing it uh, the trend uh, but you also can do like uh, you know perform a trend analysis uh, you can test whether the trend is uh, significantly uh, statistically uh, significant and also you can then uh, compare not only um, uh, you know assessing the, the trend but also you can um, for example uh, quantify uh, the the what you call it the the difference between um, between uh, the level of uh, parastemia, if I'm not I'm not mistaken, between each group, uh, do you know you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, probably. Um, for the uh, for the next, uh, I will uh, do the uh, more uh, analysis for the uh, for the. Uh, parastemia level itself, uh, considering uh, uh, the the number of mice that I use per group, and then uh, probably uh, for the next future uh, for the research plan, probably uh, I will uh, use uh, more uh, mice per group, considering uh, to the uh, data for analysis for the parastemia level itself. Yeah, yeah. I think because because now you you just rely your uh, you know your conclusion based on those graphs, uh, and then you decided because uh, the uh, the one is you know showing like the decline trend, and then you said that this is work. The others not work. But uh, if you see there's different you know level of parastemia uh, between those other groups, and you you can quantify you know the different, and then see um, you know which uh, you know which groups show. You know the mass, uh, you know decline in parastemia, parastemia over 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 time. Also, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Henry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Henry. Next, uh, Dr. Astri, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Elsa, and thanks for the presenter for the nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, again, uh, what is the implication of your study findings to uh, malaria in human, if, if there is any, or is it too, still too far from uh, human studies? Okay, thank you for the question, Dr. Astri. Uh, okay, the implication of this study is to uh, knowing the efficacy of the Soneratia alba itself as new candidate of anti-malarial drug, considering uh, we have uh, uh, that preliminary data of the uh, ex vivo that uh, we screen that we have uh, that this Soneratia alba is uh, have um, uh, anti-malarial activity that inhibits the growth of uh, Plasmodium uh, bergei sensitive parasite. So uh, I think uh, for the future uh, study, uh, this study uh, also have um, uh, can uh, a change uh, to the uh, for the uh, ma malaria in human especially because uh, in here uh, we use uh, parasite uh, model in rodent is the because is the basic research because before uh, we uh, we use uh, the uh, human malaria we we should try first in the model rodent I think yeah uh, but how prevalent is this plasmodium bergay to in, in human is there an infection human infection by plasmodium bergay and if not uh, can we uh, imply that if this uh, is what is it compound that you found would also be effective for the more prevalent plasmodium in human like uh, falciparum or 5x? Okay, thank you for the question, Dr. Atri. Uh, so um, this uh, plasmodium bergay, uh, 
uh, why I use this Plasmodium bergei because Plasmodium bergei is uh, having a similarity with the uh, malaria, human parasite malaria like uh, Plasmodium falciparum and uh, why uh, uh, big, uh, why we use the Plasmodium bergei model to uh, to the uh, basic research first to the uh, this uh, develop and discover the new antimalarial drug because this uh, Plasmodium bergei uh, has um, uh, a similar uh, beside of the similarity with the human human malaria parasite. Uh, this Plasmodium bergei uh, uh, have uh, this cycle of um, it's uh, for twenty four hours because uh, uh, it's uh, it's a promising. Uh, I think it's a promising model for uh, anti-malarial study because it's um, uh, uh, representing the human uh, human malaria in uh, in human. I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Elsa. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mbak Asri. Yeah. Thank you, Andita. So everyone. Uh, we approaching at the end of the these sessions. Yeah, thank you very much of uh, for your presentation, Andita, Mesia, and also uh, Vida. Yeah, for sharing the study, which is interesting. Yeah, we learn a lot from this session about the potential of malaria uh, target, potential drug, and then uh, the potential drug candidate, and also. Uh, attempt to develop malaria parasites model that resistant to artemisinin. So thank you very much. And uh, I want to close the session and remember that tomorrow there is still interesting topic to follow. Yeah. So thank you very much. And the judge, uh, Dr. Henry, Dr. Asri, thank you very much also. And have a nice day for everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Elsa. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih. Do we stay in the same room for the next? Sorry. <laughs> we could leave the breakout room. So this is the end okay. of the decision. So we can leave the breakout room. And oh, we do not okay. have to sorry. back to the meeting. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, all judges and all presenters. Have a great day. Have a great day.